He's globally recognised as a leading ecological thinker, teacher, writer and speaker, promoting permaculture as a realistic, attractive and powerful alternative to dependent consumerism. And David, of course, is the co-originator of the permaculture concept following the publication of Permaculture One, co-authored with Bill Mollison in 1978. Other key publications of his include Permaculture Principles and Pathways Beyond Sustainability in 2002, and most recently, Retro Suburbia, The Downshifter's Guide to a Resilient Future, published in 2018. So please welcome David Holmgren. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, I suppose it's a long time since I was originally asked to speak at uh, Garden States, before COVID and its discontents upended everyone's apple cart. And I thought about some erudite presentation about the ethnobotanical markers of cultures and subcultures, the history of the counterculture under prohibition in the last half century, or a myriad of other topics interwoven with the origins of permaculture over that period. And with reflection, I thought these tumultuous times of delay and deferment came to the idea that some storytelling might be less work, more fun, and maybe just as enlightening. All of these stories are ones that I've told over the decades, uh, but it's really only in the last decade that I've taken to using storytelling as a serious part of communicating permaculture to diverse audiences. Apart from my parents and their peers being storytellers, my uh, co-originator and mentor, Bill Mollison, was the consummate Aussie yarn spinner, telling stories in which it was hard to sift fact from fiction, but always there was enlivenment and enlightenment. So Aussie Street's a story that I've been telling to enliven the ideas of retro suburbia, which is in turn powered by permaculture ethics and design principles. And permaculture, for those who are not familiar, is a design system for resilient and regenerative land use and living. And it's been crafted over nearly half a century by tens of thousands of practitioners, designers, teachers and activists around the world, but originating here in Australia. Some claim it as Australia's greatest intellectual export. After many years of the oral form with Aussie Street, I took to the keyboard to capture it in text. And that experience revealed to me the magic embedded in the oral tradition. And as I typed the story, all of those tellings grew so large with many twists and turns that it had to be radically edited. Aussie Street is now our street, retold from the perspective of the kids in the street through the decades of for the golden age of suburbia in the 1950s up to the second Great Depression uh, in the 2020s. And I want to return to my childhood in suburban Western Australia to start this collection of stories with a picture or two to illustrate them. At eight years old, I ranged over a vast territory from the wild tadpole swamps of the Adderdale foreshore on the Swan River to the Canning Highway and even dodged the speedboats and Rocknest Island ferries to swim across the river to the CSR sugar refinery in the industrial wastelands of North Fremantle. But the backyard at Wrexham Street was the focus of my much earlier oral explorations of both botanical and zoological edibles at a very young age. My mother's jade plant, Crassula ovata, by the back door, never managed to grow much 
because of my continual browsing. And in its crevices, I foraged for the small white Mediterranean snails that were characteristic of the West Australian limestone coastal country. However, with the development of an irrigated garden, the much larger Western European garden snail arrived, much to my delight as I crunched them up, shell and all. I don't remember any of that. That's a family story I am retelling. Round the corner from the jade, I do remember the patch of ornamental chilies with gorgeous, plump, red, green, purple and yellow fruits. After I ate one of those, my mother reported that I screamed for 20 minutes continuously because she actually timed me, hoping that finally my predations on her backyard ornamental efforts might abate. I don't know if this was a precursor to the permaculture injunction to grow food rather than ornamentals, but it was also at an early, an early and painful experience of psychoactive substances. In my teens, I had few reasons to be rebel against my parents, who were considered cool by my friends. But I continued to explore beyond the boundaries of their experience with my intellectual interest in biological and synthetic substances to elevate consciousness rather than the alcohol-saturated Australian cultural norms. In a small circle of peers, Timothy Leary's Politics of Ecstasy and Aldous Huxley's Doors of Perception informed our discussions well before I learnt to inhale to gain insights with smoking marijuana. Our first joints were rolled from buddha sticks I bought back across the Nullarbor after a school holiday's hitchhiking foray to Sydney in December 1971, where me and a friend connected to a source through a uni student share house in Redfern. Unfortunately, my friend's mother found our letters that included reference to the contraband. She consulted the father of another close friend who was implicated in the letters, who was also our family doctor. He decided to call the drug squad. My respect for him fell through the floor as I consulted with my parents about what to do. Given that a visit from the drug squad seemed quite likely, I reluctantly agreed to flush the Buddha sticks down the toilet, even though I thought this an extreme response. The drug squad officers, officers duly came to collect me at John Curtin High School in Fremantle after my mother agreed to leave the family business in the Perth CBD for a meeting at home at Wrexham Street. On arriving home, I invited officers inside, one following me to the kitchen as I prepared myself a snack. But before I did, I put a record on the stereo. I don't recall whether it was conscious or not, beyond wanting to show that I was comfortably in control while we waited for my mother to return, but the record I chose was Company Canes, a product of a broken reality. Uh, it just ha so happened that the first track was called The Day Superman Got Busted. They had, of course, assumed that my mother would be terrified that her darling son had been smoking the devil weed and easily manipulated as they attempted to get a confession from me, which I declined to do. Eventually enough, they waived the incriminating letters, suggesting that they had enough evidence to lay charges, at which point my mother exclaimed emphatically that David has made it clear that he isn't interested in making a statement and that she was a busy woman, businesswoman, who needed to get back to her staff. 
Realising the situation, they changed tack as they prepared to leave, addressing her reassuringly that if she ever had any issues, she should feel free to contact them. She escorted them to the front door with the curt response, I am more than capable of raising my children without your assistance, thank you, with the door closed just less than a slam at their backs. I put on company cane again at full volume. I wonder what the cops made of their day's work. In that final year of high school, I partook in five carefully planned LSD trips and was academic ducks of the school, for which I was not recognised because I refused to wear school uniform for the ceremony. Letters between my mother and the de Deputy Director of Secondary Education uh, did ensure that I received the gold watch awarded by a Fremantle jewellery business. I have memory from the last of those acid trips of contemplating ditching the watch in the nearby reservoir in the bush where I was because it felt like it maybe had magical powers to constrain, confine and imprison me. This was a rare experience of paranoia for a super rationalist who never remembered his dreams. I credit those five LSD trips with providing a small crack in my super rationalist mindset that gradually widened over the decades to a sense of awe at the wonders of both the human mind and of nature at large. In that way, I see those experiences as perhaps stepping stones to permaculture. To avoid causing my parents worry, I didn't reveal my encounters with LSD until after returning home from a year hitchhiking around Australia in 1973. Since then, I can count my encounters with psychedelics of any kind on one hand. Useful species of all descriptions, but especially food, was part of the economic botanical research that was central to permaculture. During those two pivotal years sharing his house and life in the mid-1970s, Bill Mollison and I went on a plant collecting expedition around Tasmania. At the time, I was working on the manuscript that three years later would be published as Permaculture One. We saw the biological resources of the planet as a treasure trove from which we could design cultivated ecosystems mimicking the patterns of nature. Rather than always fighting against her to grow a limited range of monocultural annual crops. While our focus on the botanical edibles was intense, even obsessive, trying all manner of new vegetables, fruits and nuts. Zoological ed edibles were also part of our research. Bill's favourite food was mutton birds, the fatty squabs of shearwaters taken from the burrow nests after they've been tirelessly fed pilchards by their parents. While the name mutton birds certainly reflects the abundance of fat, the taste is definitely of seafood that they've gorged on. I remember one of Bill's favourite quips about meat, supposedly from an African academic colleague, was, if God hadn't intended us to eat people, then he wouldn't made them of meat. We discussed and debated the then currently new diet for a small planet, advocacy of grain, legume balanced proteins, the harvesting and potential farming of native animals and the incredible importance of seafoods 
in the indigenous and contemporary Tasmanian diet. Bill was a fisherman more than he was a forester, and several of his younger mates were the wild risk takers who pioneered the Tasmanian abalone industry, supplying the insatiable Japanese market for seafood. At the time, Derwent Estuary oysters had just been taken off the market after pe local people were vomiting from eating them. Chemical testing by Professor Bloom at Taz University showed zinc concentrations high enough to be the emetic. Over 100 years of zinc ore stockpiles at the electrolytic zinc works upstream were the source of what was really Tasmania's equivalent to Minamata Bay in Japan. But their catastrophic adverse health effects because of the high proportion of seafood in the diet. It was only that lower proportion of seafood in the Tasmanian diet that saved Tasmanians from the huge doses of the cadmium, lead and mercury associated with the zinc. An interesting fact I remember at the time was that Professor Bloom found that on a dried weight basis, the oysters were 10% zinc, on a, which is just mind-boggling. And perhaps an extraordinary example of how marine fil filter feeders certainly illustrate the saying, you are what you eat. Out in the food garden, we saw the blackbirds eating the berries and the flocks of sparrows eating the grain in the chook pen as just further abundances to be harvested. Bill instructed me on making a double cone trap for the sparrows and how to hold the little birds with a modest pressure to the heart until it stopped. For blackbirds, a plastic uh, fruit on a rat trap uh, worked well. We tried various recipes after peeling rather than plucking the birds. Word circulated that Mollison and Holmgren were eating sparrows and blackbirds. When challenged one day on this outrage, I recalled the rhyme about four and 20 blackbirds baked in a pie being part of our cultural heritage. At Meliodora, a decade later, the arrival of sparrows inspired me to make a double cone trap confident that I could catch a whole flock. After barely catching a solitary bird, I wondered if by some hundredth monkey phenomenon, sparrows had learnt about double cone traps or whether Victorian sparrows were just smarter than Tasmanian ones. There are very few sparrows these days, replaced by watchful ravens. Um, that also seem to have displaced the blackbirds. I'm not so adventurous in harvesting zoological abundance these days, but I can say that chestnut-fattened cockatoo does taste quite nice. In 1977, when Bill Mollison resigned from his tenured position at Taz University to take permaculture to the world, I moved to the backwoods to hone my skills in ecological hunting and gardening in a marginal mountain climate and to see if I could make permaculture-inspired self-reliance a personal reality. I became a caretaker in a modest cottage in a failed intentional community in Jackie's Marsh after most of the first wave of back-to-the-land settlers had already vacated leaving four lone bachelors in their respective cabins spread out across the upper marsh. I became the fifth, accepted with caution into this somewhat elitist but very frugal club. All lived without electricity or running water, uh, eating from gardens and progressively shifting from vegetarian diet to one encompassing more of the abundant wildlife. The dole, or a, a little paid work or sold produce, uh, covered out-of-pocket expenses. While the land had been purchased with modest savings rather than bank loans. Hard to imagine that today. 
as a foil to this frugal lifestyle that I relished, the Martians had their occasional splurges of excess. One of those was a once a year trek through the rainforests of the Upper Marsh over the saddle above Golden Valley on the horizon in the picture uh, behind me and down a forest road to a fine French restaurant in the middle of nowhere powered by its own hydro off-grid power plant. With bookings ahead, the English Francophile chef and his French wife hostess would lay on a luncheon banquet for the Martians. With no breakfast but a rest stop at the top of the 300 metre climb to take in the view and smoke a joint or two ensured a ravenous appetite. Our host Nick regaled us with stories and of course the origins of the food ingredients including the Lactarius deliciosa that he had foraged. In the late 70s, edible fungi other than field mushrooms were a rarity. Nick retold of his experience while living in Melbourne in the early 70s, foraging edible mushrooms in the pine forests of Mount Macedon. On this one occasion, he got his car bogged and he'd walked to the Mount Macedon shop to seek help. The woman behind the counter asked in a best strine if he'd been collecting mushrooms in the forest. After he confirmed, she said that the Italians and Greeks are always at it, and then asserted, they're all poisonous, you know. Our host let that sink in and then exclaimed to us, did she really think that the Greeks and Italians had different digestive systems to the rest of us. These days, the number of foragers of edible mushrooms around where we live grows every year, but we still manage to get our fill of Lactarius each autumn. More generally, knowledge and documenting of consumption of edible and psychoactive fungi seems to be growing apace but not as fast as the explosion of fungal diversity and decomposition in this hyper-wet season we've experienced in Jara country. We all like variety, but nature doesn't always oblige. So one of the deep learnings of permaculture and neo-peasant self-reliance is learning to eat and like what you and nature produce. Our own high degree of food self-sufficiency is much due to our eating habits as from what is available as it is the skills of garden farming and cool elements of permaculture design. So when you have a fajoa hedge as a fire retardant, shade and drought tolerant edge to go zone one garden, that gets all the surplus water and nutrients, including pea bucket contents in winter that few other plants can usefully transform the nitrogen and the phosphorus into abundant fruit the next season, you end up harvesting 200 kilos in a good season. In Southern Australia, where frost can limit most other guavas, the fajoa is king another iconic permaculture plant, which people variously love or alternately think the fruit tastes like toothpaste. Just keep that dental reference in mind as I continue the story. For New Zealanders who mostly grow up eating fajoas, their relative scarcity in Aussie gardens and food markets makes the average Kiwi act like a junkie when offered the prospect of getting a decent hit of their favourite flavour. Someone really should do an investigation to see if fajoas have got some addictive agent in that innocuous green fruit. Maybe even those sweet fleshy white petals that birds and children love to pick set up the addiction to the fruit the following autumn. 
The reason there are so many Fijoas everywhere in New Zealand is because back in the 1960s, when horticultural researchers were looking for a new crop for New Zealand to conquer the world, they settled on three candidates. The tamarillo, or tree tomato, with its beautiful red or orange shiny, red, uh, shiny fruit, but just okay flavour. The fijoa with its green, lumpy, dull fruit, but spectacular aroma and flavour. And of course, the rambunctious, woody vine, Chinese gooseberry, with the weird, hairy, brown fruit that looks lovely when cut and has quite a pleasant flavour. Chinese gooseberry, a stupid English name for mi ho tao, which means monkey fruit, won out, mainly because of the keeping qualities and transport ability, while Fajara readily rots soon after falling from the bush. So it's still uncommon as a fruit of commerce. I wonder if the decision might have been different if the researchers had realised consumers could be turned into addicts of Fajoas. With our first big Fajoa harvest at Meliodora, we experimented with various forms of preservation, but also followed the principle that it's better to pig out, like all of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, and then have a break from that food uh, until next season. So we ate a lot of Fajoas. On breakfast every day, scooped out, snacks during the day, and sweets in the evening but none more than our boy Oliver, who gained, was gaining a reputation for being a big eater of all forms of permaculture abundance. What we discovered is that if you eat enough fajoas, it turns your teeth black. Luckily, the effect is temporary, but the larger issue that I discuss in Retro Suburbia is that eating too much acidic fruit is as bad for one's teeth as too much sugar a combination of acid and fructose in those years when we overdid our consumption of fruit we were producing in abundance, left a legacy of decay and expensive dental work for me, Sue and Oliver. These days we sell more of our fajoas to local organic shops, caterers and sundry kiwi addicts looking for their seasonal hit, although I still look forward to the season with relish, having never lost the taste for them even if my consumption is less than the dozens a day we once ate. So that's our son Oliver, a little older and a little wiser, but still the consummate fruit forager. Although he's clutching freshly foraged avos in this photo, the story extends over two decades of experience living with what we produce in the cool, temperate central highlands of Jara country and the taste for exotic treats. The story begins before the Fajara abundance when Oliver was just two and our new gardens produced little in the way of fruit. We lived on a very modest local diet, including purchases at the Dalesford Sunday Market. For a special non-local treat, we would buy Oliver a banana. And so he grew to see bananas as special, which could sometimes be a problem when he visited other households where the fruit bowl had the mandatory apples, oranges and bananas. When he was four, we took a trip to northern New South Wales where we promised to buy him a bucket of bananas. It was spring when we arrived in Armidale for a public speaking event before heading down to the coast. Oliver was very frustrated. After travelling more than a thousand kilometres through inland Victoria and New South Wales, Armidale seemed just like home, with cherry plums in blossom, but no bananas in sight. I again promised him that once we left the tablelands, down through the escarpment rainforests to the Bellingen Valley, we would find bananas in abundance. Stopping at the first roadside stall of a small organic farm, we only found luscious custard apples for sale, but no bananas. Oliver was visibly upset. So after putting some money in the honesty box for some custard apples, we hightailed it down to the coast 
and at the first big fruit stall selling conventional produce, we bought Oliver 10 kilos of bananas in a big plastic bucket. Our boy was in seventh heaven as he worked his way through his bucket of abundance. Nearly a decade later, we took a winter trip up through Central Australia to the top end. Over the years, Oliver's taste for exotic fruits had matured from the humble banana to mango. Somehow in my ignorance of tropical fruit season, I suggested that when we got to Darwin, there would be mangoes in abundance. After a slow trip north, we arrived at the top end to find the mangoes just flowering. Oliver had to console himself with climbing a beachfront coconut palm and enjoying the delights of fresh coconut milk, an act he repeated big time 14 years later at Cape York after an epic 16,000 kilometre off-road adventure touring motorbike trip documented in a web blog, sunkenmiles.org. While various tropical novelties kept us interested, salt was rubbed into the wound for a sultry teenager when we camped in the first mature organic mango plantation at Kununurra, where the trees had small green fruit that smelt of ripe mangoes. That smell memory stuck with Oliver over the years of his occasional seasonal indulgence in a purchased mango until he headed off in 2007 for a world trip. After some time in Mexico working as a builder's labourer restoring a 400-year-old church with a, a crew that didn't speak English, he headed south but the mangoes were not ripe and then to Guatemala, but the mangoes were not ripe. At the same time, Sue and I were on a teaching trip through Latin America, American permaculture networks, and we arranged to rendezvous with Oliver in Venezuela. This photo was taken the day after we met. It's up on the house roof, harvesting those avos from a giant tree taller than the three-metre house, a three-storey house. And it was from there that Oliver spied a mango tree with early ripening fruit. I don't have a photographic record, but I remember the smile when he bit into the first foraged mango eight years after that disappointment in Darwin and Kununurra. Over the next weeks, we shared the delights of mango diversity, including a journey to a 450-year-old food forest of Chihuahua, famous for its cacao beans. We savoured the cacao fruits, the raw beans, and the rough chocolate made in the village from what wasn't exported to a Swiss chocolate company. But it was the abundance of mangoes that occupied Oliver Moore. He reported eating 60 that day. To the amazement of our hosts, he did not get sick and still loves mangoes. How am I going time-wise? Ten minutes. Right, skip that story. And return to this one, to uh, return to discussion of cannabis. I think in my early childhood, I lost my faith that mind-awakening substances would bring about a global consciousness revolution. But over the years, I continued to partake intermittently in marijuana, both for social connection and occasional insights it provided. Partly because Sue didn't partake and the fact that we hosted tours at Meliodora, I never grew the plants. This didn't stop the idea spreading around the local redneck circles that since we didn't appear to commute to work to any obvious job and we had a greenhouse on the side of the house hidden from the street, we must have been growing a crop to finance ourselves. 
Perhaps we would have never known this without Oliver deciding he wanted to go to school at age nine. He had a tough time uh, being accepted mainly because of his own unbroken self-confidence, but also because one of the cyclical subcultural wars between hippies and rednecks was playing out at Hepburn Primary. Kids would make the sign of a smoked cigarette, in fact joint, to goad him and it took him a while to realise that this was a reference to the kids' belief that we were dope growers, no doubt gained from their parents' speculations. Little did they understand that we were, in fact, part of a permi cult of sun worshippers and that our passive solar greenhouse provided the majority of our winter heating needs and that during the summer, a jungle of edible plants, although the closest to a cypotropic species in the picture are tomatoes or love apples, as the early English gardeners called them. Ironically, one of the local redneck families whose kids had taunted Oliver were later done for dealing heroin. On tours of Meliodora, Sue would remind people that although the house worked wonderfully, it didn't do so by itself. Thus, passive solar and active humans, which all worked so well with our predominantly home-based lifestyle that some of the locals obviously found impossible to understand. Active humans, yes. But while Sue is one of the most energetic and productive persons I know, she can also sleep anywhere and often takes to snoozing in the greenhouse in winter and spring. Meliodora publishing editor Beck Lowe captured this pic of Sue sleeping on the job proofreading. By this stage in the development of Meliodora as a publisher, Meliodora the property had three semi-autonomous households. The studio, which was built for my mother in her last years. While waiting for it to be finished, she chose autonomy over comfort by living in the fairly Spartan tea house where she wrote the tea house poems, the last of several books that uh, marked a late started career as a published poet. During that tough period of uprooting and migration from her home of 30 years on the far south coast of New South Wales, I attempted to alleviate my mother's chronic pain problems that standard prescription drugs had not managed to help without serious adverse side effects. The marijuana oil I gave her didn't really work, perhaps because Vini tended to take it like painkillers and may have overdosed at one point leading to her ditching my oil, just like she did with all the doctor's drugs. When she moved into the studio, complete with her own passive solar greenhouse containing the bathroom and compost toilet, she called the place Poet's Corner. Her spirits revived, she did more performance poetry, indulged in her passion for seafood, and she even took to the stairs up to what the sky room, as we called it, where she was cataloguing her papers and photos. But the chronic pain continued, and with passing years, she needed more and more help than we and the home help services could provide. Around that time, our office manager was sharing house with us. He had some habits in addition to those of us permaculture Puritans. We tolerated his regular consumption of coffee, wine and joints because we loved him dearly. And the bonus was he got on with Vini like a house on fire. Joining with her wordsmith obsession with regular bouts of Scrabble at which she was an ace. Seizing the opportunity to move into the studio and occupy the sky room, our mate became Vini's housemate and living carer, in the process rechristening the place the house of indulgence. 
where he cooked for them both on the Thermalux wood stove, the same as the one uh, he had in New Zealand years before. He also took to cannabis cultivation after having more success with managing Vini's chronic pain with carefully calibrated biscuits that he served with her one wheat coffee for morning tea. Vini authoritatively informed the doctor about the success while recognising that he couldn't formally endorse what was still illegal. The plants that started in pots in the relative privacy of the sky room soon spread to the greenhouse as pest-confusing companions to his beautifully trained tomatoes. We agreed on the plan to grow the best for my mother and if by chance we were sprung by the authorities, I would have taken to a public stoush over managing my mother's medical needs according to her still sharp mind and strong will as a lifelong dissident and in the process do my bit to nudge along the end of prohibition. In my youth, I naively assumed that prohibition would fall over as soon as my generation got their hands on the levers of power in the 1990s. But as the crop spilled out into the garden, I became more concerned about the claim that the crop was only for my mother's and, of course, her carer's consumption. It was as if the fevered imagination of the locals decades before was manifesting in a crop more valuable in theory than anything else we'd grown at Meliodora. On property tours, I would bypass the studio to protect my mother's privacy and that of the now huge cannabis sativas that increasingly reminded me of the Triffids in John Wyndham's classic sci-fi novel, Day of the Triffids. We are forever indebted to our good friend and colleague for his quirky care of and companionship with Vini in her last years, even if the process was very tough for him towards the end when we real, relieved him of his role once she needed 24-hour care. Still lucid and sharp, after a week of respite care in Hepburn House, she made the decision she wanted to move in. Although it felt like a failure on my part not to have her at home for her last days, she seemed more serene and settled than I'd ever remembered her. She read her just-released ACO file, dispassionately pointing out the various errors in the spooks recordings of her years as a card-carrying member of the CPA and later in my childhood as a pioneer in opposing Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War. But the fire and the passion for the facts and the issues were gone. I asked if she wanted me to bring her supply of biscuits, and she said she no longer needed them, that the chronic pain was gone, cured by the cannabis, or just faded as the body unraveled after 93 years. This photo was taken back at Maliadora a couple of months before she died. Her funeral and wake at the House of Indulgence was a memorable event, recorded in part on our website. During the evening, as yarns around the outside fire pit, lubricated by homemade cider and the odd joint continued late, Vini's housemate came out and upended the contents of a 10-litre airtight tin onto the fire the most perfectly grown, harvested and lovingly dried female heads of cannabis up in smoke. So much for burning banknotes. I'll never forget this gesture of devotion from someone who came across as a complete cynic. And as a footnote, amongst my mother's well-organised papers, I found the correspondence to and from the education authorities in support of me, both in 1972 and an earlier one in 68. We were so lucky for all of this to have happened before COVID and the mad, bad and illogical policies that further enclose the last remaining shreds of dying with dignity that is typical in medicalised bureaucracy. 
I see these stories as expressions of a lived and loving connection to nature, dodging the obstacles and constraints of a dysfunctional culture that is facing its own end of days. But as with all death processes, there's also rebirth. As we struggle to avoid the worst excesses of increasingly fascist governance with medical tyranny masquerading as care, I think we need more storytelling as part of a truth and reconciliation process of our fractured families, networks and communities. I thank the organisers and networks represented at this conference for providing space where we can tell some personal truths from the decades of dysfunctional prohibitions that have characterised the last half century. From reading John Michael Greer, I now understand that storytelling is a simple form of magic by which, through an act of will, one changes consciousness, not the material world. We live in magical times when competing forms of very complex and dark magic struggle for control of more than seven billion souls. Can we draw on the wisdom of our forebears and ancestors to tell stories that reclaim our humanity from the moors of the machine? Thank you. David, thank you so much for sharing your stories. We've got some time for questions now. If anybody would like to ask David a question, we have a microphone uh, near the stage over this side, if you'd like to come forward. And there is also an opportunity to send questions online through our Slido application, if anybody's tuned into that. In regards to, in regards to storytelling, what would you say to your younger self to kickstart your influencing storytelling in order to create a generational conscious shift to be able to share the uplifting message of nature and, and without uh, berating on a uh, or entering into um, the past? So, mm. well, how, how would you formulate stories and how would you teach your younger version to have? told more impactful stories to create further impact? Well, certainly when I was young, I was very focused on the facts, the evidence, what I knew about a subject. And that was also partly as a reaction, my own slightly negative reaction to Mollison's spell that he cast through storytelling, through the sort of charismatic uh, expression of, of, of things. So I was very focused on what are the realities. I saw a lot of people who were inspired by Mollison run off over the hills to change the world, fall in the first ditch and say, well, that was a load of rubbish, wasn't it? And discard permaculture or whatever. Uh, and so that was my reaction to always, here's what I know about it. Put all the cards on the table. And what I found was that Sometimes people were really appreciated of that, appreciative of that honesty, but sometimes they'd go, gee, it's complicated, isn't it? Uh, I don't know whether I could do that. And I thought, I've just disempowered them. And I also saw cases where Mollison had, had sent someone across the hill and they'd fallen at the first ditch and got up and continued. And, you know, they got somewhere, if they looked back, they thought, gee, if it if I'd known how difficult it was going to be, maybe I wouldn't have started. <laughs> so what I discovered is that different people just need different messages and at different stages of people's lives need different message. But I think storytelling is also something that also comes with age. And I listened and learnt from Mollison's stories and like, uh, as I said, my parents' stories. But it was only when I got asked to speak to graduating architecture students, uh, I think in 2000, about the next 30 years, and I was thinking about the last 30 years, and I thought, oh shit, most of these people I'm talking to 
weren't born 30 years ago, and I started more channeling my father's obsession with history. And so I think it is partly a sort of an age and generation thing. So I don't know whether I, I actually needed to start as a storyteller when I was younger. Sure, thank you. Yeah, challenges the intellect in, I think, a lot of us to really bring in more of the patience into the learning around this whole world. Yep. I've been gardening for five years now and I've just heard a little bit about getting soil testing done. Would you recommend getting soil testing done in a, in a suburban environment? Uh, yes, I would for two reasons, uh, especially in older suburbs for the thing that a lot of people are aware of, of contamination. But for soil mineral balance, as a serious food producer, I think it is worthwhile. When we started at Meliodora, soil tests were very expensive. We had very little money and we didn't have people that we could trust in terms of interpreting that. That situation is a lot better now and for, for serious uh, food production, yes. We address all of those lessons, learned lessons in our big manual uh, retro suburbia. It's, it's definitely a, a useful uh, base. It's not the full answer to things, but I am a great prom proponent of that idea of getting the mineral balance roughly right, especially when you are eating a significant proportion of your food from that system. Because when you eat from the supermarket, you get a mix of deficiencies from actually some of the best uh, farmland in the country. Uh, whereas when you eat from your own place, you get the deficiencies of that place. Thank you. Firstly, I, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for everything that you've done with Bill and, and yourself. It's made a huge impact on my life and I'm really grateful for everything that you guys have paved the way for. And I, I just got the urge to ask a more light-hearted question because I yep. heard some stories about how you maybe managed to self-publish some of your literature with Bill. And I was just curious if you could shed some more information. Whoa, well, that's a, a long story. Of course, Permaculture One, I can remember discussing with Bill after we got, um, well, he did a, we did a, a radio program in, in 70, uh, 76 with Robin Ravledge in Sydney on what's now Radio National. And then as a result of that interview, um, Terry, uh, Lane on Melbourne Radio picked up and, and did a, a long interview with Bill and following that we got offers from 15 different publishers wanting to publish Permaculture One. Now what was going on in Australia in 1977 that 15 publishers approached uh, an unknown cantankerous academic and a completely unknown graduate student wanting to publish this manuscript. But anyway, I remember the discussion about, oh, I favoured this little um, uh, publishing company in Melbourne called Greenhouse Publications and Bill said, no, we we'll go with the, the global publishers, Corgi. And then that experience led both Bill and me on our separate paths both into self-publishing through the dissatisfaction with that, uh, that process. And of course, he set up Tagari Publishing and of course his great designer's manual uh, was pulled together on a Mac Classic with a nine inch screen in northern New South Wales with um, incredible illustrations by uh, Andrew Jeeves who also did all that layout. And we began with a sort of case study uh, publication much later than that in, uh, of our property and other case study publications in the early 90s. And that evolved into uh, Meliodora Publishing which now is a fully-fledged permaculture publishing, still micro-company, of which now I'm just an author I'm not responsible for. But I suppose it's a whole journey of do-it-yourself experimentation and also challenging a lot of the orthodoxies and established principles and also the gatekeeping that I thought the internet sort of smashed, but it didn't in relation to publishing that, you know, does something which is self-published actually have status? So my principles and pathways beyond sustainability, the big book of theory is in, what is it, seven, eight languages? Um, 
Uh, it's never had a mainstream review. It's a really complex book of ideas. It's sold um, over 10,000 copies in Australia and never had a mainstream media review. Um, that's just some of the issues of the, the gatekeeping that still operates. Um, and we've seen a, an incredible intensification of that to try and lock down the, the wild west of information on the internet through this new, very rapid surge of what is proper information, what is misinformation. Um, and so there's this huge struggle going on of the control of what is valid sources of information and what is valid debates that actually can be, can be had. If you were to bring out an updated version of retro suburbia today, whether the idea of tiny houses is the next answer in retro suburbia as a development to meeting this need of a housing crisis in our society. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. And uh, David and I connected in the forest campaigns back in the late 70s, and then I discovered his connection to these folks that we met through the, the retro suburbia research who are in, as he said, on the cover of the, the book. Uh, in fact, tiny houses are mentioned as one of the strategies in retro suburbia, and we very much related it through uh, a matrix of, of options between um, developing control of your environment uh, versus downshifting and disowning on the one hand and consolidating where you know uh, best or moving to somewhere else and that that creates four solution spaces and the one in the lower quadrant we call uh, mobile minimalism of young people with tiny house uh, on the move uh, maybe but also that solution of actually workarounds to current planning constraints. I have to say that I was fairly confident that we were facing the unravelling of the bubble and it was going to happen because the global financial system was heading for a much bigger systemic crisis than the 2008 one and the 2008 one was avoided by unprecedented money printing. In October 2019, it was heading for something far worse with the sovereign debt crisis and the repo market. And the money that was created out of nowhere for COVID was the cover to stop that collapse. And that created the greatest shift of wealth to the corporations and to the wealthy and this insane mad building boom that's uh, gone everywhere. So these things that are happening are uh, are sort of not just some product of a market where there's, oh, there's a shortage of housing and we need new houses. What happens next? Who knows? But everything is moving very, very fast. So we still shouldn't regard this as some perpetual reality that keeps going. Because when the money stops, there will be no more building. There's so many buildings we already have there's no shortage of buildings in this country at all. David, thank you so much. Uh, we need to wind up there. I really appreciate your wisdom and sharing your personal stories. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank David. And I'll be out at the bookstore. And uh, David will be out at the bookstore if you want to catch him and, and bend his ear out there. That would be fantastic. <laughs>